Environment ministry officials in Japan will start a long-awaited and contentious project later in the day, four years after the nuclear disaster in Fukushima. They're overseeing the transfer of radioactive soil and debris to an intermediate storage facility. The waste has been piling up across the prefecture as decontamination work continues. Officials spent a considerable amount of time trying to find a suitable site because they had to negotiate with residents. The storage facility is located in an area between two towns near the damaged Fukushima Daiichi plant. Construction only began last month, so the transfer will start before the facility is completed. In the first year, the Environment Ministry plans to transport 43,000 cubic meters of contaminated materials from across the prefecture. So far, the government has only secured enough land to accommodate less than half of that. Once completed, the 16-square-kilometer facility will hold up to 22 million cubic meters of waste. But the timeline is unclear because negotiations with landowners are ongoing and have been difficult. Environment Ministry officials also need to start looking for a location to store the contaminated materials long term. They promised the citizens of Fukushima that if they host the intermediate site for 30 years, the final disposal facility would be outside the prefecture. Four years have passed since the nuclear accident at the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Members of at least 53 households have decided to live inside evacuation zones despite the risks involved. The current law stipulates no punishment for people remaining within the restricted areas. The Japanese government established evacuation zones in 10 municipalities due to high levels of radioactive fallout around the plant. Low, medium, and high danger zones are based on corresponding levels of radioactivity. The government allows residents from low and medium zones to return home temporarily during the daytime. Security patrol groups told NHK at least 53 households in the restricted zones are occupied. They say people are even living in highly contaminated areas. Some residents say it's difficult to adapt to a new environment, and others want to take care of livestock left behind. Government officials have repeatedly warned residents of the health risk and urged them to leave. But the officials say it's difficult to persuade people who want to stay. Many people in northeastern Japan have been working to rebuild the region in many different ways over the past four years. When the tsunami roared ashore, they ravaged coastal communities and killed thousands of people. They also damaged cultural assets. A museum curator is working to preserve those assets. For him and his team, it's a matter of maintaining memories of the past for people of the future. A calligraphy textbook made it through the tsunami, but not in the best condition. Just as this photo shows, the documents were soaked in seawater and smudged with mud. Masaru Kumagai, the chief curator of the Rikuzen Takata City Museum, and his team intend to counteract the damage. They've been going through the volume, page by page, to remove sea salt. Projects of this sort have kept the staff occupied for most of the past four years. The tsunami that struck on March the 11th of 2011 brought waves that rose almost 18 meters. They engulfed the center of the city and left widespread devastation. Construction is now underway to raise the ground level. The tsunami reached the ceiling of the second floor of the museum, filling the structure with mud and debris. For a while, no one could even get inside. Artifacts were scattered throughout the building. Some were buried under debris. The tsunami claimed the lives of six employees of the museum. Kumagai was the only one to survive. Rescuing the items inside became his mission. He convinced people to come help remove debris by hand. They approached the task like an archaeological dig, retrieving everything, no matter how small. As of now, they've rescued some 460,000 items, about 80% of the collection of the museum and three other facilities.
物の資料を託し The artifacts and documents represent the people who donated them. They also embody the devotion of the staff members who work to preserve them for future generations. I wanted to send a message to the tsunami saying, we will not give in. The process that Kumagai and the others have been engaged in is called stabilization. It removes salt and bacteria from artifacts damaged by the tsunami. To the naked eye, the old textbook may look okay, but it's been inundated with salt, and that could lead to the growth of mold. Kumagai decided it needed another night of soaking in water. The complete process involves 21 stages. Even if everything goes well, start to finish, it takes at least a month. In many respects, the team is having to find its own way. Very few tsunami restorations have been done anywhere, so the best practices have yet to be established. Collaborating with other organizations, the group has stabilized 160,000 items in these four years, relying largely on trial and error. Once stabilization ends, restoration begins. The support of local people is essential. Each week, Kakumi Murakami helps restore fishing equipment. After a career working around the sea, he's got the know how that's needed. He fixes every detail of the baskets in a traditional manner, from the material of a rope to the way of weaving. Many folks have worked very hard to rescue these items from the mud. I'm here to help. These artifacts represent people's lives, aspects of their identities. Reconstructing infrastructure brings the community back to normal. Preserving cultural assets is another. This involves healing our residents' hearts. Despite the progress, nearly 300,000 objects are still waiting for attention. Lacquerware, leather, and many other things cannot be soaked in water. Kumagai and his staff are puzzling over how to proceed. They don't know how much time will be needed to stabilize the entire collection, but they're determined to work towards that goal, piece by piece, day by day. Civic groups in South Korea are calling for sharing some events with other cities in the country and even overseas. They said the organizing committee should make use of existing facilities in other South Korean cities. The groups also said the idea of shifting some competitions to other nations should be considered. Possible sites would include Nagano, Japan, which hosted the 1998 Winter Games, and a new ski resort in North Korea. They said doing so would save the country nearly $750 million. They added that this would also allow the facility to avoid money losing operations after the games. In December, President Park Geun-hye rejected the idea of co-hosting the Olympics. The United Nations World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction begins Saturday in the northeastern Japanese city of Sendai. One of the big names scheduled to attend is World Bank President Jim Yong Kim. We talked to Kim about what role Japan can play in global disaster risk reduction. Thank you for taking time. Oh, not a problem. This will be Kim's second visit to Sendai. His first was in October 2012, shortly after taking up his post. He was impressed when he went to an elementary school damaged by the tsunami. Having drills, for example, uh, they had drills in those schools, and so they were prepared in those schools. We're now trying to, set to, to ask ourselves, shouldn't we apply these principles of preparedness, of, in, uh, of making sure that you're investing in the right kind of infrastructure? The World Bank and the Japanese government last February established a disaster risk management hub in Tokyo. The idea is to help developing countries cope with disasters. Specialists from around the world compile information about the effects of major calamities. They offer developing nations technical advice that suits the local situation. The World Bank issued a report last July that offers advice to developing countries. 
It's based on knowledge and experience that Japan gained in the March 2011 earthquake and tsunami. I think, you know, there's so much now very good data on how important it is to prepare. And so, uh, in, in, in Tokyo, um, the, the fact that we have this disaster risk management hub is affecting our thinking in so many other areas. The things that we're learning through our experience in disaster risk management are not only going to help us prepare countries all over the world to disasters, but it's even extending to things like pandemics, which are themselves disasters. Now, in pandemics, what we know is that the difference between an, a response that happens in a few hours versus a few weeks or months is huge. And so uh, it's very, you know, the, 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 uh, the impact that this hub has had in terms of our overall thinking has been much greater than, than we had even expected. The joint effort of the World Bank and Japan underlines how crucial it is to get financial aid quickly to those who need it. Kim says disasters stretch the resources of developing countries. In very poor countries, what happens when disasters strike is that there's no source of money that can immediately be dispersed uh, so that they can, you know, look for people, for example, who may have been, you know, uh, uh, caught under the rubble uh, if, they're, if, they're, if there's a, uh, an earthquake, for example. And so we've now put together financial instruments that will disperse very quickly. The level of preparedness for disasters doesn't exist everywhere in the world. And so we've got a lot more work to do with Japanese leadership in helping everyone to prepare uh, uh, for disasters. Kim wants Japanese experts attending the conference to share their know-how in creating a system that ensures developing countries can handle the challenges that disasters present. Marion Madsen, NHK World, Washington, D.C.